The Lord told me we would march around the walls once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, we will encircle the walls seven times. Then, and only then, will the entire company shout when the shofars are blown. Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Next on Our Jewish Roots. We are so glad you've joined us today. I'm David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. I'm Joshua. And I'm Caleb. Rahim Habayim. Welcome, my friends. Guys, this is the episode everybody's been waiting for. Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho. Ah. It is. I, I did did you, guys, song. you guys went to Sunday school, right? Oh, yes. Did you hear the song about Joshua? Second Ready? grade, it's ingrained <laughs> in my head. I want to hear it. Goes like this, you probably know it. Joshua fought the battle, battle of Jericho, 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 Jericho and the walls come a-tumbling down. Hey, that was a good addition well, there. You, they didn't <laughs> sing with us. I didn't <laughs> sing with you because I was drawing in a moment from my Thank childhood. You. My father you was your moment. Well, he, he was a DJ, my father, oh, yeah. and, and that was my favorite song, and he would play that for me. So not only did he win Best Out on Earth, but that just brought back all those nostalgic memories. So It's an oh, incredible story but and, and song, yes. and you are Joshua. You're mm. playing Joshua in this. Yeah. There's a lot of Joshua today. That's right. Yeah. This is a pinnacle moment in Joshua's life where he comes across the commander of the armies of the Lord, and it changes his life forever. Okay, real quick, the commander yeah. is, who do you think it is? is I it believe it's the theophany of Yeshua. I mean, he said, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground, just like when Moses uh, talked with God in the burning bush, and he bowed down, he worshiped him, and, and he didn't say, no, stop. You know, this was a pre-incarnate visual form of Yeshua. Yehoshua meets Yeshua, and it just blows my mind. It's amazing. Ooh, that's good. good. Mm -hmm. Right now, let's go to our dramatic reenactment, all about Joshua. The ram's horn, different shapes, different sizes, all reminders of Adonai's sacrificial provision of a ram in place of Isaac. When we hear its sound, we recall the miracle on Mount Moriah. And now, as we face the imposing forces at Jericho, the blast from the priest's horn will summon yet another miracle. But first, the soldiers under my command must be readied. Need sharpening. This one, replace it. This is a poor sampling. You can do better than this. See to it that your men are armed well for tomorrow. They'll precede the priests and the Ark of the Covenant. And see to it that the priests have their shofar as well. Can this be done by day's end? I think so. That's not enough. We circle the city at sunrise. I need to know that this can be done. Yes, sir. I encountered an angel yesterday. Sir? An angel. He had a sword in his hands and said he was the captain of the hosts of the Lord, of Adonai. I've used this in many a battle, but I shudder to think how quickly he could have overcome me. What did you do? He told me to loosen my sandals, for I was standing on holy ground, and I made haste to do just that. Sir, I'll gather my men and prepare as you requested. Tomorrow we take Jericho. No. No. It won't be tomorrow. The Lord told me we would march around the walls once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, we will encircle the walls seven times. Then, and only then, will the entire company shout when the shofars are blown. I'll prepare the ropes as well so we can scale the walls. That won't be necessary. 
Then how do we take the city? The walls will fall on their own. On their own? Yes. One stone upon another until the walls are no more. And then our armed men will enter and utterly destroy this city. If every man does as the Lord has commanded, Jericho will soon be ours. Go. And the walls came a tumbling down. Joshua called it some 3,400 years ago, and it happened just as he foretold, right here in Jericho. Walking among the ruins is to walk through the verses of Joshua chapter 7 and consider the extraordinary faith of a remarkable conqueror. There are 20, 20 discernible layers here in what is, if not the oldest city in the world, certainly one of the oldest. I want to be careful as I walk among these ruins. Look here, you can see the remains of an old wall. And this ruin speaks to an old wall. I don't know that this is the one that tumbled because it's one of the 20 layers that are discernible. This one's still standing here at a city called Jericho. It's noted in the book Devarim and the book of Psalms as a city of palms. And the reason is, and the reason why Jericho was inhabited so long ago is because here there are copious springs roundabout. And when there's water, there's life. And when there's life, there's people. And when there's life and people, there's palm. It's, it's a world that's springing forth from a wilderness that sprung forth many, many years ago. And this, friends, was the first stop on the train when Joshua and company make their entrance onto the stage of the historical drama. A battle royal was raged here in Jericho, but before the men got to fighting, the Lord went ahead and did some fighting first. We're told here before they get to the city of Jericho in the fifth chapter. And it came to pass that when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, and there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. Joshua, we're told then, was curious who side this guy was on. He said, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he said, lo, kiani sart siva adonai. He says, no, I am the captain of the Lord of hosts. Very interesting expression. Joshua, in effect, has a, an experience. He has a religious visitation. I mention this because some people are tutored up intellectually on things divine. Others have an encounter. And the leaders, the history makers, have some kind of experience with God showing up. And in that conquest was the issue of the day. Here, before it all gets going, the Lord shows up, sends his messenger, angelic, if you will, as the captain of the Lord of hosts, who is going to go with Joshua as Joshua went in to the promised land. Joshua, we're told, as we read on, fell on his face and bowed down. And that, by the way, is the proper uh, response to the divine a kind of humility, a kind of being awestruck by it. And he said, the question, He bows down and asks the question of this heaven-sent emissary. He says to him, What saith my Lord to his servant? By the way, wouldn't the world be a better place if religious leaders understood themselves as a servant subjected to a higher authority? In fact, the word minister itself comes from the Latin minus. It means less than, that is, a servant to. And here's Joshua, 
the one who's vested with responsibility to lead two million souls into the future. And he bows down, he's humbled, and he says, what is your word to your servant? And we're told the captain of the Lord's host said to him, put off thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. There's a famous song in, in, in the Christian world anyways, that we are standing on holy ground. When people have a sense of dwelling amidst the sacred, it evokes a kind of sincerity and piety that wouldn't otherwise be there. I say that it used to be that church structures themselves were built to denote a kind of sacred space. That is to say, it sticks and bricks to be sure, but it's a dwelling, the only utility of which is a place for worship. That is to say, sacred space. That is to say, holy ground. Would that we all were humbled the more so when we enter into that space. I think personally that if individuals were more humbled in the face of divine, they might hear from him. So many times, uh, you know, people don't hear from the Lord. Uh, God's voice is obfuscated by their own anxieties and secular concerns, legitimate though those concerns may be. If we are going to be more than conquerors, we need the good Lord's help in going forth into the battle. And I should say God is more predisposed to help those. We're told that he raises up the humble. We're told that he humbles the exalted. And here's someone who is coming into his own as a, a world-class leader, a, a religious leader, a, a military leader. This man's life is gonna be characterized by results. And I should say against all odds. When Joshua began, when he scouted out the land, people were intimidated by the locals. They were not only intimidated by the size of the locals, they were much bigger, but they were intimidated by the fortifications. And approaching Jericho, this walled city with large inhabitants in it, Joshua was ready to jump into the fray. But before he donned his own armor, he approaches someone who's God's heaven-sent messenger to him. He humbles himself as unto the Lord, and he worships God. He's going to rise up from that and do great things. Would that we learn the lesson, for if we did, like Joshua, we would be more than conquerors. I think it's amazing that God is who He says He is outside time and space because He set up far in advance for the Israelites to come and take Jericho. In fact, He heralded their uh, coming into Canaan with all the Canaanites saying, oh, it's amazing, uh, these, these Israelites are coming. They, they came out of a, of a Red Sea, you know, on dry ground and the plagues in Egypt and, and they wiped out King Sihon and King Og east of the Jordan River and their fame was just, you know, to elevated levels that the Canaanites were shaking in fear that the Israelites had come to their doorstep. And we know that because of one Gentile woman named Rahab. Now this part of the story you probably remember well, Joshua sends in two spies, not the 12 from original. Yeah. <laughs> he learned that sometimes not all 12 have a good yeah, report. Two. These two were faithful men. They went yes. in, uh, they found this uh, establishment that probably had a brothel attached to it, <laughs> and they met this woman, Rahab. Mm. And what's so amazing about this woman, besides the fact that she was not Jewish, yes. and that she had a profession that would not have been, uh, made it into your uh, Sunday morning lessons, um, was the fact that she had faith and believed to the point that mm. she was established in Hebrews chapter 11, the, the hall of fame of faith because right. of her actions of declaring that their God, Adonai, was the true God. 
I find it amazing that Gentiles are grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. This is always a part of God's plan. We see that when, when God had Moses write down uh, the, the book of the law, they made a special establishment for foreigners to come into a land, to not be abused, uh, to be a part of the commonwealth of Israel. We see when they came out of Egypt, Egyptians were grafted in. They came with them. We see in the wilderness, Midianites were grafted in, uh, Rechabites and the Kenizzites. So God always had this plan that he wanted the Gentiles to be included. And so Rahab, if you know your biblical history, marries Salmon, son of Nashon, who happens, they have a child who's named Boaz, and Boaz marries Ruth, and that goes across the Messianic line. The Messiah comes from this goy, from this prostitute named Rahab, and this was all part of God's plan from the beginning because of her faith, because it, without faith, it is impossible to please God. That has always been so mind-blowing to me. We always ask the question, well, who am I? Mm. This woman did not wake up that day knowing this was about to happen. She felt no worth probably in her profession and the choices that she had made. Mm. But when the moment was presented in front of her, she seized the moment and stood in faith for it. And it changed not only her destiny, yeah. but it changed a destiny to which the Messiah himself came from her lineage from that choice of faith. Let's go back to Dr. Seif and find out the conclusion of what happened in Jericho. They marched they blew and the walls came a tumbling down. Children learn this story from a young age and it's a story about the miraculous. It certainly is worth having a look at and it's good to be reminded that God does the miraculous. What's troublesome in the story and I want to address it on the front end when we look at the conquest of Jericho is that it says in chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Vohayata ha'ir cherem, that is to say, a city that was devoted to utter destruction. Other language for it is the city was placed under the ban. That means everything dies. Nothing is taken. It's not a war in the conventional sense, the way they were fought out in antiquity. Men fought men, and the winner made off with the, the spoils of war, the plunder. Women, livestock, uh, various goods and the like. No, this was wholly devoted to the Lord. It is something that invokes the ire, understandably, of the conscience of moderns. And as we look at the story, I want to begin by tendering something of an explanation for it. In the violent Middle East. And if you look at Jericho, it's right there at the edge. There's worlds that collide. North Africa, uh, the armies came through this area. Asia, Europe, uh, these overland routes. This was an area where armies came all the time. And this sense of the way that this story unfolded not only gives uh, an explicit victory here in Jericho, and I'm coming from here in Jericho, not only that, it sends out a message into the region where others are dispirited. And those that are more apt to, uh, those that are more dispirited and fearful, they're more apt to be more reticent, reluctant. It gives the Israelites an advantage here by having a strong beginning on the front end it provides, as I'd said, something of an advantage that wouldn't otherwise be there. Well, I want to speak to the moment in the biblical text, not so much offer a defense for it, as much as to unpack one or two elements of it. We're looking in the book of Joshua, and as I noted, we're in the sixth chapter. It closes, by the way, in verse 27. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. I noted that a decisive victory telegraphs strength, and that bodes well for the Israelite armies. But before we get there, in the sixth chapter, uh, we're told, if you'll go down with me, please, in verse 20, the story here that uh, the priests and the people, they blow the horns, they march, and we're told the wall fell down flat. Now, the felling of the wall in Jericho, here in this place, wasn't the victory. You say, what do you mean by that, Jeffrey? Well, 
the wall leveled the playing field, if you will. The fact that the uh, people in the city were in a wall, they were up on the ramparts, it gave them a tactical advantage. And the Israelites weren't used to taking cities. They were gonna to have to get them more used to it. But what happens here when the walls come down, that's not the, the, the end of the war, it's just the beginning of it. The Israelites still have to marshal their courage and they have to go through uh, the rubble and make their way in a world where combat was man to man, hand to hand. And that took courage. The point is they still had to do it. I know many you know, religious people, oh Lord, please do it, and Lord, and, and the Lord does it. The Lord goes with his people, but that does not exempt them from participating in the war effort. You know, people pray for good jobs. This is good, we should. Doesn't hurt as well to get an education and put out a lot of resumes and work at it. It doesn't hurt. Just uh, expecting success to drop out of heaven. I know you can hear that in church. Just come to this church, put your money here, and, and, and oh, the bad things are gonna stop and it's all gonna come out of heaven. Listen, I think if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. It's not as simple as that, at least not here. The one who tells this story doesn't believe that. The one who tells this story gives a vision of God with us. They still have to marshal the courage, marshal the energies, and throw themselves against the trouble of the day. And this they did. We're told here the wall fell flat. That is, it, it, it levels the playing field. So that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. I like this, by the way, of uh, you see divine intervention, you see the supernatural, you see men marshalling their energies and throwing them against the troubles of the day and doing what the Lord has put in front of them to do. And that, my friends, is a good word to my way of thinking. In this series, Joshua, more than a conqueror. We're looking at success in life. How does that happen? There's a lot of people that aren't enjoying success. Friends, I think you might find a recipe for it here from the ruins of Tel Jericho. A story here of someone who seeks God, that is Joshua. He's reaching out to God. God reaches down to him. There's a divine messenger. There's a divine appointment. There's courage. There's God going before them. And there's Joshua leading his men on into the fray. And at the end of the day, guess what happened? They won. Could there be applications for us? I think there very well could be. And I'll hope you'll find some in it. Here's Joshua, Yeshua. That, by the way, is the name for Jesus. Can he lead you and me to have good success? I think so. There's a principle here in God's word. Learn it, live it, and like Joshua, you'll be more than a conqueror. That is the namesake for the entire series, Joshua more than a conqueror. That is how Joshua and the Israelites made it into the Hebrew Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11.30 mm -hmm. when it says, by faith the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. Yes. I love that. I, I don't think it was by chance that seven days was the number. Mm. Any significance to that number? <laughs> Actually, there is. Um, research done by the famous uh, Dr. David Livingston and W.F. Albright tell a deeper archaeological story concerning this. Um, back then, the kings of Canaan were seen as part divine, you know, part godlike. Mm. Uh, and they probably were, probably Nephilim, you know, these hybrid kings. And you have the city of Jericho, which was a royal city to the Canaanite moon god, Urek. And as legend goes, according to this famous Ugarit legend that all these Canaanites knew back then called the legend of Coret, there was this divine king, Coret, 
and he was spoken to by the god El. They said, you go out and you find your bride at this city. So here, take these armies. They took the armies, they took these trumpeters, and they went on two six-day march intervals till they reached the city. And on the seventh day, they give this loud shout before he takes his bride. And so I find this very interesting. And you see, obviously, the parallel with the Battle of Jericho, how they marched around six times. On the seventh day, they marched, you know, six times. On the seventh, they gave this loud shout. And, and it, it, it just, it goes so much deeper than that because this, this karet, this divine king, was called B'nai Il, the son of God. Mm. And so I, I'm telling you, those people in Jericho, when they saw them marching around, they may have been confused, but by the seventh day, they knew that Elohim was mocking the Canaanite gods, but he was showing himself strong yeah. as being the one true God, and then those walls came tumbling down. And that he had a plan for that oh, whole absolutely. seven days. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it happened at their, their, their feasts of the new year. They were worshiping their gods. What a better time for the one true God to show up and just shake up their plans. People, wow. people hey, so, I, yeah. I gotta say, yeah. I never knew that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, I mean, I know, the, of course, you know, seven is God's number and yeah. completion. I had no idea about that. Fascinating. Sorry. This, no, this is what I love about God, though. Everybody says, well, to be, a, to be a believer, you have to just have faith and forget about science and forget about mm -hmm. proof. God has gone to such great lengths to not only say, my word is true, but then he goes and establishes it. He mocks false gods. Yeah. He, he, if you delve into the scripture, he proves himself every time. Mm -hmm. And he continues to do that. Even today. Thank you so much for your insight and what you oh. brought to us. And I, I want to ask you, would you like to see what Jericho looks like now? You can. We, on our tours, every tour, we drive around Jericho. And uh, these last two times, we've actually had the best pizza in the world, <laughs> right, right near Jericho. Fascinating story. It's still there. You have the opportunity to see it with your very own eyes, plus the rest of the incredible, gorgeous, holy land. We go two times a year. We would love for you to be on one of our buses with us. Also, the production of the dramatic reenactments of Joshua. We wish we could just do it for nothing, but we need your support, your financial support. Just want to say thank you so much for allowing us to continue what we do and bring you more stories and more series. Guys, okay, next week, yeah. next week, Israel has its first defeat. Oh, wow. yeah. I don't even want to it's talk a sad about story. it. I don't want to go into it, but we okay, got we it. won't go into we'll it yet. To it. Yes. We'll wait for next week. Time to go. Would well, you close us till out? Then. Shalu, shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs, the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter, which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online, or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store. There you can order this week's resource, or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to Zola Levitt Ministries helps us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember, we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you.